Good evening and welcome to the Obelisk. Tonight's guest is Chris Snipes and Hunter from the Melt Podcast. I heard Chris, I think it was about two years ago I found your show oh. and fell in love with it, especially your sultry voice oh, and uh, smooth delivery and just your low-key attitude and the, uh, the fantastic array of guests you had on. And then Hunter joined about a year later. It's been about almost a year now, right? A little bit over a year? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and uh, the show's just blossomed from there. So, absolutely uh, fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you so much, and welcome. Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you. Our yes. pleasure. Hey, uh, for the uh, melt in house, Hunter uh, and Chris. This is a <laughs> pleasure. Well, I'm certainly happy to have you here. I've already had my introduction on my other. No, wait, on your show. For some reason, I felt like I booked you guys. <laughs> I can't. I can't keep track anymore. But you it's two that are biosexuality just biosexuality as well. I know. It's confusing <laughs> you. You I know. Me, but you didn't miss yet. You talking about yeah. the cosmic salon? Yes. So we have definitely got to do that. But at least we have been introduced to each other and had yeah. a fantastic chat. I loved being on your show. Thank you so much. Thanks to, thanks and, to me. I, I feel like we're we're still in the honeymoon stage with you, Nish. Like you, you, you are so much in our world right now, and we've heard nothing but praises about you and your work. And I am just in awe of your mind. And uh, oh, girl, let's yeah. break open the champagne. You're getting me excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm I'm into it. You know, I'm into the cut of your jib and what you're doing. You know, you're doing some great work. Should we just thank go you? Bowling, Jerry? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> thank you. It is a great Let's pleasure. Wait till Igor comes out. Oh Lord, oh Lord. Just so everyone knows, you know, we have fun here and we like to joke around. And long ago in the early days, before actually Knox Mente, when Jerry was running the hive, and right when Cruising with Steak went on, we were crazy. We mm. were we were comics. And in that period of time, I let the world know that I named my pussy Igor. And <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone who's not aware when Jerry makes an Igor re reference, that is it is, it's my minge. And, um, and that's, that's how it goes. Mingy. <laughs> mine is, mine is she who shall remain nameless. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. That's <laughs> ominous. <laughs> of a Voldemort snatch. Oh my God. Exactly. <laughs> hey, it doesn't have a nose. I mean, come on. I was going to say, is, is your clit hood flat? <laughs> Left me with a, with a lightning bolt scar. Okay. There you go. Oh shit. Oh, that's nice. Well, that comes with powers. Yes. Yes. And <laughs> huge, huge responsibilities. Of I course. Think. You have to go Aloha Mora to get it to open up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Harry Potter geek, by the way. I just started. Hey, have you heard of the uh, the new podcast, The Witch Trials of of uh, J.K. Rowling? I have not. Oh, it's good stuff. Uh, Megan Phelps Roper. I don't know if you guys know who she is. Excommunicate. Uh, she got. Uh, what am I trying to say here? She expatriated herself from the Phelps Westboro Church. Ah, um, interesting. Padre, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you guys know who that is. Yeah, the church? God hates fags. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wonderful signs that they used to show. Yeah, she got herself out of there about 10 years ago and uh, has been doing wonderful things. And she just started, she just released a podcast, sort of like a mini series of uh, the witch trials of J.K. Rowling. And it's just Great stuff. Good story cool. about her whole, the whole gender controversy and all that stuff. It's fantastic. What's the ginger controversy? Oh, ginger. superhero ones? The Xing out of gingers and superheroes, that one? <laughs> she is a ginger, actually. No, oh. gender controversy. She was so bold as to say that, you know, women are biological females. You oh, know. yeah. JK, yeah. JK did, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to check it out. And I'm proud of her for standing the ground. Subscribe. Oh, yeah. I subscribed. <laughs> Jerry's on it. I'm already subscribed. <laughs> Jerry, will you make sure you send me the link to one of the places I will look? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Maybe Keybase. <sighs> Fuck Keybase. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
How are you two doing tonight? I keep forgetting. Are you you're on the East Coast, right? Kansas. We are in. Oh no, you're Midwest. We're yes. smack dab in the, we're literally in the middle of the country. Midwesties, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. We're How are y'all great. doing? We're doing fantastic. Would yeah, you say things so? are things are great. School started this past Monday, so I'm back in the thick of it. Oui. And uh, I'm a McNair scholar, so I'm in the midst of working on a beginnings, uh, the beginnings of a research project. I am studying my research is on um, artificial intelligence and men who have relationships with um, artificial intelligence, whether it be a computer or a real doll that has AI um, embedded in it. Yeah, I love this subject. This is going to be juicy. Yeah, you know, it's it's the post-human movement that, uh, you know, a lot of people have been talking about for the past 10 years that I've really kind of taken a, a shine to. How it all started was I saw a film, a documentary called Silicon Soul, and there's a fantastic psychoanalyst in the documentary named Danielle Canafo. And she... Who's been on the melt. Who's been on the melt. Yeah. And she uh, wrote a book called The Age of Perversion about men who make this transition from being in most of them very what would be considered heteronormative relationships and then having you know bad breakups, heartache... And just waking up one day and saying, I'm done with women. I'm going to get it all. And there's this whole subculture and community of men who are doing this. And they're very active online. Some of them are incels. Some are just, you know, middle-aged guys who have had kids grown up and moved on and moved out and multiple divorces. And this is their And one of them just had a baby. What? Did the doll? Just, well, yeah, a guy who was in a relationship with a doll and married her. I forget uh-huh. where it was. <clears throat> Excuse me, but they just had a baby together. Oh, my goodness. I'll, I'll, find, one I'll find the story. So, a baby doll? Is that... <laughs> it, is, it is a baby doll. <laughs> it's probably one of those reborn babies. They look so real. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, a 36-year-old Hunter, f- man from Hang- Hong Kong. Of course, he's from uh, Hong Kong. Yeah, of course. Not that I'm typing, but you know, <laughs> it does. I I saw that documentary as well, and I've I just keep my finger on this pulse, and it does seem like there's a lot of pushing for this in, for some reason, in the Asian world. More. Yes. The, am I wrong in that? It seems like it's no. very very prevalent. You absolutely nailed it. And there's a couple, there's a couple of different reasons why I think the one child policy had something to do with that in China. Uh, You know, in China, all bets are off. So they're selling sex dolls that are children. They're selling sex dolls that are infants Oh Uh, in Japan. And they won't, they won't import those dolls to the United States. They're illegal here in the United States. Uh, so God, you know, thank God we have some modicum of yeah, of because decency. that's hideous. That's it is hideous. That's, oh it is absolutely God. hideous. And there's a lot of controversy in the psychotherapy and and uh, psychoanalytic world of whether or not that is a training ground for men to go on and become pedophiles, or if it actually stops them from becoming pedophiles. But that's not research I'm really interested in doing. What I'm more interested in is this looking at the contrast between Japanese men and American men that are going into this um, artificial intelligence world. Some men can't afford the doll, so they get an AI girlfriend that's online Mm -hmm. uh, that you can tweak to have the personality, the voice, um, they ask you the questions that you want. Uh, and then there's the segment of, you know, there's middle age. There's two different segments. There's the middle aged man who has had relationships before. And then there's the segment of man that's the young man who's never had a relationship, never touched a breast, never had a girlfriend, has no no social skills whatsoever. And those men are also going into the 
world of AI. And interestingly, inst interestingly enough, there are brothels that you can go to in Japan that have sex dolls. It's it's wild. And of course, that's a step towards, say, uh, the all these shows like humans. Do you remember that one? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, and I thought that one was very compelling. The English mm -hmm. uh, did a really good job with that one. And they brought in all these different aspects of this. And, and I they, mean, re we... they release consciousness as a virus. Yes. 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 Interesting take. I wanted and to bring you could up tell by their eye color. That was interesting. This yes. idea of AI relationships, though. I'm I'm a like a synchromistic autist wannabe mm -hmm. wannabe I'm not <laughs> I'm not like at a Chris Knowles level yet yeah yeah but um this AI relationship that has been seeded since the 90s uh if you remember the movie The Sixth Day with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger where uh was it Rappaport John Rappaport or I forget the guy's name he's been a real asshole lately Michael Rappaport Michael thank you plays his partner and has like a, a an AI girlfriend but it's mm -hmm. a touchy feely AI in the future in that movie. Yeah. Which I think was 2000. And also, uh, there was a Joaquin Phoenix show, a movie called, I think yes. it was called She? Yes. Her. 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 Okay, yeah. 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 I got the yeah. pronoun wrong. Surprising. Proper <laughs> 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 pronoun. I know. Well, <laughs> this really started. And the Jerry. new Blade Runner movie, too. It, well, it, it goes way started, back. Yeah, I know. It was the Stepford Wives in yes. the 70s. Yeah, yeah. That that was my first introduction to that. And I remember seeing that when I was little. We're all kind of in the same age range. Sure. I saw it at the drive-in. <laughs> I I never got the feeling. Well, okay, so I don't remember the movie exactly, but I never thought they were androids. I thought they were just programmed. I did too. Oh, like mind, they, mind controlled. Yes. they were android. They switched them out. And, in, yeah. in the new yeah. version, yeah. they did, but I don't no, think they. No, in the old, no, in they? the old okay. version, they were straight up robots. And I, yeah. just, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I, did not I it, just so. watched it recently. Hunter, I think that I'm sorry we could you. make a case. No, this is right in with what you're talking about, Jerry. I think we could make a case that Metro, uh, Metropolis from the 20s absolutely was pulling on this thread. Absolutely. Well, yeah. It all goes back to Blavatsky <clears throat> and the eugenics and theosophy and how, you know, there's going to be this, this new Aramon, right? Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, this new technological age that will bring in this new breed of humans, and I think that's that was the the key moment that transhumanism started. In, well, to me, I, th I, I think the the interesting uh, dichotomy here is there's two different movements happening. There's the transhuman movement, and then there's the posthuman movement. And what we're talking about is posthuman. What they're interested in is doing away with humanity entirely. Like we're yes. done. Yeah. So that's the real red flag to me. Like you want to have, you know, a suppository that has all of your information on it and walk around and feel like you're a robot, go for it. That's your business. But I, my concern is that we are getting to this stage where uh, what you might consider regular um, heteronormative or even homosexual relationships, any type of human to human contact is considered outmoded. Like we don't, we don't want that anymore. That's not cool anymore. Now it's cool to have a girlfriend who can never break your heart, who can never hurt you or a boyfriend who can never break your heart, never hurt you. And that you were in absolute and utter control of. They brought that up really well. I can't, was it Spielberg? The movie AI with the little boy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it was the same idea, but with a child and I'm telling you what, if you have abandonment issues, you watch that. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I cried in that because it's the same thing. This child, the child that will always love you no matter what, will always be a child. So it's this idea of artifice and how you want it served to you. How is it going to interact with you? What are your needs? And this can serve it. And so it, it becomes very scary when we look at the idea of the future and where we're going because we're going deeper into 
augmented reality, virtual reality, metaverses. You know, we saw lots of stuff talking about this early on from like Atari all the way to Second Life to here we are. Um, this this is very concerning to me, and I am not in this camp. And one of the things I wanted to get on this, Hunter, is your take on it. Like at this point, what's your just gut feeling about all this? Well, I think as a soon to be a therapist and counselor, I think I am approaching it with a lot of compassion and empathy and an understanding of the isolation that these men are feeling. And I think that that's the first step to uh, creating some type of a dialogue with someone who's in this world. Uh, it's easy to poke fun of it to to other these people and say they're freaks, they're weirdos. You know, it that would be the easy road to take because it is strange. But uh, uh, on the same token, I don't think that that's really helping the conversation by further isolating these people who already feel isolated. So I think that's kind of like my my through line in my perspective. And I think the next level of that is what is this saying about women? What are we saying now? The women are um, so easily replaced. You know, we're not even going into the uh, transgender dialogue. Let's just talk about someone deciding that they they're done with humans entirely and they just want this object that they can quote unquote love. And does that love include sexual contact? Perhaps maybe it's just companionship, but what, what has driven us to this point where we feel like out of, you know, whatever the statistic is, there's some people that say there's 8 billion people on the planet. There's some people that say that, that, that there's a lot less than that, regardless of what the number is, what does it say that we can't relate to each other? When did this real doll movement start anyway? Because we've had inflatable dolls since at least the 70s. Yeah, yeah forever. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, that's the first thing that I think of when I think of a man with a doll. It's like he wants something that he can have sex with, an mm -hmm. object, and he doesn't want to have a relationship with it. He just wants something besides his hand to get him off. But these relationships are very complex. They're, they, they're actually, these guys are very gentle with their dolls and talk very highly of them. Whether they would act the same way in a relationship with a human being, I don't know. It'd be interesting to, to, to map that. Um, but yeah, they're very intricate. Like didn't, didn't one of these guys learn Japanese because his doll was Japanese? He's created Dave Cat, the, the man who was highlighted in the film he has i think five or six now and he's married the primary doll that he married he uh, has this whole backstory for her and she has a facebook page and she she quote unquote speaks online and his backstory for her is that she's japanese so he learned to speak japanese so that he could communicate with her so what does that tell you about this man's inner world that he's learning another language, that he's bifurcated his brain so that he's thinking sometimes he's speaking as his doll and sometimes he's responding as himself to his doll. It It is very complex. I had, when Real Dolls first hit the market, one of my friends bought one and and he had her for years and he finally, he sold it to another of our friends very cheaply. And it, so I got, I got to experience a little bit of this. He was not, he was still having relationships with women and he, and he does it, but I found it interesting because I didn't understand where he was coming from. This is a very, very attractive Cuban American guy, um, a real good friend of mine who could get any, you know, he could always attract any kind of woman and including me. And uh, it, it intrigued me on the level of what was his reasoning for it. And he never really would get into a dialogue about it. Hmm. And except for 
Well, he never did. I could never get a dialogue out of him as to why he would do it. And they were like, I don't even know, $10,000 or something. It was crazy yeah. expensive. Yeah. And um, it, I don't know. It, it's interesting. But the point I wanted to move in here is I love artifice. And I find that, you know, I'm a doll maker myself. I have a huge collection of antique dolls, like a thousand of them. Mm. And I'm sitting here, I caught my studio audience with about 40 just looking at me. Wow. Right, ar right around the computer. And, you know, they're all various ages, but none, you know, up to the 1920s. Wow. And I just, I've always loved them. I can tell you the psychology of it from my childhood because the toys were taken away. So I yeah. know where this comes from in me. Yeah. Yeah. And I can sit and talk the psychological aspect with you all day. I can iron that out. So it makes sense to me. One of the things with like with my friend who could get any woman he wanted, very charismatic, money, all of it, that he would seek that out. At first, I I I thought, well, this is a novel. He's doing it because it's a novelty. And then when he wouldn't really interact about it, I thought, oh, this is deeper. There's something psychological going on here. And uh, this is what this is what intrigues me. And it was definitely a sexual relationship with her. And he did her up the way he liked her, you know, the way he liked his women. Right. And so it became clear to me that that's when it came home for me, that this isn't an other person out in the world. This is this is a man that's dynamic. He knows how to talk. He's really fun. He's a DJ. He, you know, he has all the options in the world. And yet there he is with one. This is, this is intriguing Hunter. Did he, cause a lot of these guys uh, bring this relationship to the public too. Did he take this doll out and introduce the doll to his friends? He DJed with him. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was. Oh, he's definitely loud and proud about all his stuff. <laughs> he was it was no secret amongst any of us. He was very loud and proud about it. But it was as far as trying to dig into. Deep. Un, a deeper understanding as to why he did it was uh, that was a firewall. And right. he and he was not really very friendly towards like everyone making fun about it either. Sure. It was very serious to him. Right. And it was a male or a female doll. It was a female, the doll. Well, uh, so the first I guess the first place if I was if going to kind of look at his uh, just who he is as a person and kind of examine him. One of the first questions I would ask him is what his relationship with pornography is. Because a lot of this is fantasy based and a lot of men that go into this world have very rich fantasy lives that are integrated with the por pornography that they watch. So they get into the state where being with a quote unquote normal girl, the, the type of girl that he would maybe want to attract is maybe off limits. And their normal sex life is boring. It, it becomes or, boring. I've, I've been down this road. <laughs> yeah. Or, or they're not able to achieve the same level of sex, sexual satisfaction with a woman because yeah. they're used to masturbating. And so they're used to their, the, their own rhythm and the feeling of their own hand. Mm -hmm. So with the doll, you're actually manipulating, you're, you're using the doll as though it was another, a masturbatory tool. Mm -hmm. What what part of this road have you been down, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let that slide. No, I mean I understand exactly what you're saying. Like, okay, consuming a lot of porn and it makes your own sex life boring. And oh, it's, okay. it's absolutely true. Yeah, but um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, the, the and the reality. I'll, I'm happy to share offline, but there's stuff I could tell you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reality is that you can seek. Uh, relationships with prostitutes. There's literally tens of thousands of women <laughs> that you can exchange your time with and would be more than happy to accommodate you and probably not be boring. Uh, I think some of these men 
they have a real the, part of the paraphilia is the control aspect is they don't want to deal with another living, breathing person. They want to sublimate a reality on this doll and then have total and utter control over it. That's one thing that I found very interesting that Chris mentioned is that these men are dressing the dolls and taking them out and it's hair and nails. And so they're able to kind of play with the their feminine side without them having to dress up in women's clothing, but they use the doll as a doll, as a form of dress up. So I think that's another aspect of this is that you're playing with your, a feminine side of your personality or your psyche and it's safe to do it in that, in that arena. Have there been any, any numbers coming in for people that are naturally introverted versus extroverted and their seeking of these kinds of relationships? Do you know? Well, right now, statistically, people in the kind of 18 to 25 year old age range are having the least amount of sex in recorded history. They're just not hooking up like people in our generation did. They're not going to bars in the same way. They're not having sex in the same way. So there's become this isolation when it comes to um, relationships and relating to each other and even casual um, sexual encounters. They're just not on the same level. And I think that you know, the whole three year nightmare that we all found ourselves in had a huge impact and influence on this movement. Uh, so I think it depends on where you are in the world, A, and B, I think it also depends on, as I said before, where your uh, relationship status has been in your life. So if you've never had a relationship, it's going to be a lot easier for you to go into this world because you're already living in a fantasy world. If you've been burned, if you know, you've had a relationship that's been fraught and, you know, someone's been che cheated on you or, you know, taken advantage of you in any way, again, it's easier to see someone kind of pivoting into this dynamic. What I find interesting is that people of our age are having more sex than they've had historically. So I think that's a weird shift. Like it used to be like sex is for the young, but now sex is for the middle-aged. We still have a connection to reality, I think. And Physi eye contact. Physicality <laughs> is still important to us. We remember the time before all of this virtual shit. And yes, yes. Yeah, we value it. We know the value of it. Right. I was just going to say, just the advent of the online dating, I think, kind of destroyed all that. Mm -hmm. That's true. That Grind relationship it. culture. I mean, now it's just all hookup culture and yeah. It's, yeah. it's gross. But uh, that developing a relationship with someone, going on on multiple dates, that just is a thing of the past. Well, and also, I I don't know if you guys have for seen... You, for the, younger people, sorry. sorry. Have you seen this new phenomena online, Jerry, that's called Whatever? It's, the the it's podcast? The podcast. Yes, it showcases the, the freakishness of the young women. It, where basically you're getting these women that are, you know, fourth generation mm -hmm. feminists who are coming on there. And <clears throat> you look at this, these women, and I really genuinely feel sorry for them because they have no idea what they're saying 99% of the time. They're just spitting out talking points. Just well, and it's just such toxic femininity. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it really, truly is. Yes, and and a lot of it is about, you know, I'm an independent woman. I'm a free woman, but I still want the guy to pay for the first meal when we <laughs> go out on a date. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> this is pointing fingers at these people, or this is a place where the, the, these people can shine? It's a long form podcast where this fellow has usually between four and five kind of college age girls yeah. get together and they just spit. He, he asks some question. He asks some point blank questions with no bias. Like uh, the last one I saw, he asked him, he pulled a Matt Walsh on him. 
what is a woman? And yeah. none of only one of them answered it out of like seven people. Yeah. The it's rest really, all waffled. It was hilarious. Again, it's one of these things, you know, my uh, minor is sociology and I'm really fascinated in human behavior and group behavior mm -hmm. and seeing how people respond to each other. And, you know, I have said to Chris for a long time, water seeks its own level. And these girls are all kind of trying to swim in this same Instagram, Insta famous world where it's whoever says the most outrageous thing or has the tightest, highest ass or mm -hmm. has the most revealing photo online is getting the most likes. And that is how they're judging their success in life. It's not based on character. It's not based on accomplishment. It's not based on excellence. It's based on who can get the most attention right and and the problem i see the no, problem sounds like bad a bad term the the problem with that is it used to be within your own clique within your own friend group right mm -hmm. that bar of where you need to go that has expanded to your online followers and your friends and everyone online so now you have to be at the top of this group that's become massive when it used to be four or five people. Mm -hmm. And it's a distortion. It is. That's what's so fucked up is that people are buying Instagram followers. And so it's bots. It's you've got 10,000 bots yes. who are clicking like on your post. So it's not real engagement. I looked at the metrics of that. And so if you have 10,000 followers, you should have about 10% engagement. So there should be maybe a thousand people commenting on your post when you post online. If you look at these people who have, you know, 14 million followers and they've got, you know, 50,000 people commenting, these anyone who has two brain cells to rub together can look at that and say, oh, these aren't real followers. So this person has bought this social media um, following and anyone who thinks otherwise is just confused. They, they just don't understand how this system is working. And so you're actually just chasing your own tail by trying to reach these levels of, you know, these, these Insta stars. Well, and, and then to, to layer cake this, all the filters that are really good now, they started out bad, yeah. but, and we're seeing some exposés now we're seeing like that one in Japan, I think, mm -hmm. Has everyone seen that where the guy was years, a few years, this, you know, young Japanese girl doing all this activity and he got someone stalked him on the street and exposed him for being a middle aged Japanese man using a filter all that time. Mm -hmm. And the filters are that good. And then there's, of course, you know, and they're called they call it like catfishing and all this. Yeah. What are we dealing with when we stop dealing with realities? And in person, Jerry mentioned this earlier, and I th I think Chris actually chimed in on it or something. The, this idea, if you, I, my mother always taught me to look people in the eyes. This is where you're going to see the truth. Right. And uh, there's a lot of, lot less eye contact these days. People will literally talk to you while they're on their phone. Like look down and they'll just respond to you, you know, when you're trying to get around at the market and all this stuff. It's unbelievable to me what's going on. And then just to throw another layer on this, that this young generation, when I was last in art school, which wasn't that long ago, as I was mentioning to the two of you, mm -hmm. there was this fear of older people that was creeping in amongst the young generation. They are literally afraid of older people. And when I inquired about what does that mean? And it, it seemed to be like 30 and up. And I was, I was flabbergasted. Like how is 30 considered, considered old? First of like all, Logan's run. Yes, very much so. So I'm just kind of throwing this all out on the table at y'all, but this is a definite layer cake social socially 
and it's shaping the future. And if we're able to synthesize this information, we can get a good look at what's coming down the pike. And it looks a little concerning to me. Yeah, but well, is, I, is, is that really the shape of the future or are we building the future based on those those remembrances? Yeah. This is a whole generation that this is really two generations now of people that have grown up digitally. This is this and now with all of the agenda pushing stuff that's going on socially through uh, social media and the Internet that's trickling down into their day side lives, which they are very much not into. It, everyone's very into their online existence right. enough that they're using these catfish filters enough that they are um, interacting more and having deeper, if you can call them deeper relationships, even if they're talking about high, how high and tight they assy is, um, you know, the, they're engaging there and not with like, mom or friends from school the the friends from school are texting each right. other they can be in the same room and they're yeah. texting each other well what's interesting about that is that depression levels have skyrocketed for young women in particular but if we dial this back and really look at the first wave feminist movement that happened in the in the mid 60s and in the 70s sexual objectification really became the the norm as a as a way to uh, be empowered as a female and i think that that is where this slow slog has started so if you go back to look at I, you know, there's so many examples, Charlie's angels, you know, the Farrah Fawcett, Fawcett poster, uh, the, the movie foxes, uh, pretty baby. There are myriad examples of women really commodifying and monetizing their sexuality and that being propped up as a form of feminism. So I think that that's really where this started. And now you add on top of that, the internet, you add social media on top of that. And these young women, of course, they're going to say, this is the only value I have because they grew up watching not necessarily those movies, but they grew up watching their mothers and their, their older sisters and their aunts and how they responded to that kind of media and how it became this ups, beauty obsessed uh, reality that that was really your cachet was your looks. So now what young women are doing is they're not going to a plastic surgeon and saying, make me look like Angelina Jolie. They're going to a plastic surgeon with a filter, an Instagram filter of themselves and saying, yes. make me look like this. And that's what's terrifying. It's it, it really. I just don't understand it. I got a different slant all along, though, like my idols were Mae West <laughs> Right. And like I, I always like these cunning women and Marlena Dietrich. So they served up beauty and they served up sexuality, but they are always the smart woman in the room or the funny woman or both. Mm -hmm. And uh, and always just a little bit way different from the other women around this idea of over sexualizing for me always felt cheap. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's because of my own personal experiences and being tossed around as a kid mm -hmm. and all that. It just felt, it also felt easy. And I don't like easy. Mm -hmm. Cue the, cue the proud Mary song with <laughs> Tina Turner. But, I, you know, it was too easy to, it, what I always knew, especially when I became a bartender was you could throw your titties into a push-up bra and be really terrible looking mm -hmm. and you could come home with some hot cock that night for real at a bar drinking sure in the clubs and it didn't matter because that point of hooking up and sexuality a lot of times breaks down to body and then what is the body shape it's a fashion mm -hmm. we go through trends we go through the, the the skinny minis all the way up to what we're in right now which is the the big bold and beautiful right and so 
it's, it's again, social engineering, programming us, telling us what is the look of beauty and what is the look of beauty now is this cartoonized yeah. image. This, yeah. this, it's like, it's not even real anymore. It's actually cartoonized. I'm making that word up, but you know what I'm saying? So uh, what I would tune eyes. <laughs> exactly. What I would ask that woman who had the push up bra on uh, that took that hot cock home is did she have an orgasm? Exactly. And, and 99% <laughs> of the time, the answer would probably be no. But what she won was she won the hottest guy in the room. So that was a form of a victory. That That's this idea that, well, I may not have enjoyed the sex, but at least I got the sex and yes. I beat out these other women. So I think that's that has a lot to do with uh, where we're where we've landed now is that women are not really having these dialogues with each other where they're saying like how do we have good sex how do we get what we want sexually you know men have been drawn into this world of pornography and women have been drawn into this idea that in order to be sexual they have to perform like people that are in pornography so i think that's where a lot of this uh conversation has gotten muddled in just human dynamics it's not just men with women it's interesting because in the latest statistics men are having the least amount of sex in that 18 to 25 range but women are having sex so what they're doing is they're turning it to homosexual relationships they're becoming lesbians Absolutely. Bingo, bingo, bingo. And I mean, seriously, you, you nailed that. And the, see, this is the thing for people like us that look at, at the programming, that are questioning the narrative, that have rocked the idea that what we're being told, and I don't know if it's the rebel gene, I don't know what it is actually, is something we should maybe buck up against. Now, this could be a Gen X quality. Our whole generation seemed to have this quality. I mean, remember, punk rock came out of this generation and and fighting fighting the power and all this. So when we started to, and then we came basically it just depends where you fall on the divide, but you know, the hippies were and not just the hippies, but that generation was bringing in the idea finally that it was our right for women to talk about an orgasm for God's sake. You mm -hmm. know, it was our right to, uh, to do a lot of things that were way more corseted from at least in America, the, the remnants of a Victorian society. Now I love all the Victorian furniture and stuff because that repression played out really great in art, but <laughs> it, it was a very prim and proper situation. And at some point, you know, energy being repressed will find a way out. And so we got that generation. We started to get, that wave of feminism and it it's backfiring now now it's backfiring and this is what i see going on with the trans agenda not to bring that in or the um these other agendas you start repressing so you, you make everyone bend the knee to something so that they have to accept it and it creates this repressive, pressurized gauge sociologically that it's going to creep out somewhere. We see this with witch hunts and all this other yeah. stuff. It's this is what I'm fearing now, Hunter, is that, that this could have a bad backlash societally. Well, I think what's happened and I see it with Chris and I'm sure Jerry experiences this as well, is that there's a real abject hatred for men now. And so what is that yes. doing to men? What is that? What? How have we emasculated men to the point where they're going to fuck a doll as opposed to being in a relationship with a woman? I think that's where a lot of this, you know, you can look at it and say, well, this is all by design. And I think to some degree this is by design, but we can't buy into the programming and say, well, this is broken and there's no stopping this snowball. I think there is a way to stop stop it. And the way to stop it is by making eye contact. 
It's by actually listening to men, making them part of the conversation, which they both should be. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and giving them and giving them the space to be who they are and not, you know, having this, this um, archetypical idea of what a man is or what a man needs to be in order for him to be valid. I totally agree with that. And I was just being silent and let, let one of these men's talk. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, I don't know where this, I think it's rooted in the hatred for whites or this anti-white movement that's happening. <clears throat> and I think straight white males get the, the brunt of it, uh, especially in media. <laughs> I, I don't want to go back to media all the time, but it's totally happening in media. You know, you've got gender swaps in, and, and race swaps in just about everything that's coming out lately that's uh, reboots or what have you. And that's all rooted in this... I don't know what. I don't know what it is. I mean, white people account for like, what is it, 4 or 6% of the entire population of the world. We're, you know, we are the minority. Exactly. And exactly. I don't, I don't understand the hatred for it, especially, you know, from other people. I don't know. It's weird. I don't really have much to say about it. I agree with everything you said. So, yeah. 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 Same here. I think that male is sort of the top of the oppressor totem pole. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that goes a, a beyond any race. Um, I mean, there's the great John Lennon song, Woman is the Nigger of the World. Like, fantastic song, says a lot in that yeah. song. Um, and But it all boils it down to male. So we're the ultimate oppressor. So we have this, supposedly, we have this heritage uh, burden slash burden that we carry around with us all the time. And we're supposed to constantly be cognizant of it and be ashamed of it and feel guilty about it. Uh, and then, you know, we grow up looking at TV at, before I knew my asshole from a hole in the ground and seeing all these stupid husbands just basically just mouthing, uttering mouth noises mm -hmm. like cavemen. You know, that's like the men yeah. are, are made out to be stupid and unemotive. Yes. And once I figured out that that's a fallacy <laughs> and that that's not the case at all and that there's so much more nuance to men and women Absolutely. That, that can't be defined. Uh, and, and what, I mean, I constantly ask, what is masculinity and what is femininity anyway? It's very culture culturally biased right well and what's fucked yeah. us is represent rep represent representation exactly this idea of this need of i have to see myself in a commercial in order to feel valid mm -hmm. and that is such utter rubbish what that says to me is that whoever is watching television or watching a film doesn't have the discernment to be able to look at a character and see outside of these, you know, these, uh, superficial costumes. Yeah. Yes. Like we've ticked the box. So it's like, okay, now we have an Asian. Now we have a black person. Now we have a black female. Now we have a transgender person, but what if the characters suck? Yes. What, yeah. Oh, you're talking about the Eternals. <laughs> well, why can't we just, decent fucking, why can't we just decent fucking writing why why isn't that enough because uh, well i mean you can see disney's imploding right now because of this i don't know mm -hmm. if, if you have followed uh, you guys know yeah. marvel stuff right so the whole phase four was a disaster for marvel they lost billions of dollars they fired alonzo this week I don't know if you saw that. Victoria no. Alonzo. Yeah. Wow. And she was like the top woke officer in the Marvel franchise. Like her and Feige are connected at the hip, basically, yeah. but they got rid of her, you know, this week. So apparently she was a bully okay. too. But she she was the reason all that shit got injected into the movies. And back to the point I was gonna make is that the reason this is so prevalent now is because we have a generation of people who were raised by the cultural Marxist colleges we've got that no one yeah. learned about until the pandemic when everyone was doing Zoom classes and parents could see this shit going on. But um, uh, the, the people writing stuff today are the product of that. For sure. That, that woke agenda. 
And mm -hmm. that's why it's so prevalent in media today is because they believe it's correct. And through the validation they receive through their circle on social media, their desire to do it and to one up everyone else gets even larger. Well, that was one of the reasons that I got into college was because of the pandemic and that whole insanity. And I, I knew when I walked in and I went, totally online. I knew, you know what? I'm coming with a completely different perspective. I've had a whole other life than the people I'm going to be engaging with. And let's see how that works. And you would be shocked how many professors wrote me privately and said, thank you for being a breath of fresh air in my class, because I didn't go in there trying to get approval. I wasn't trying to get someone to like me. I really went in with the idea of having discourse because to me, that's exciting. That's exciting to have a dialogue with someone who has a completely different perspective, especially when they don't really know what they think and feel because they haven't had enough life experience to figure their shit out. Yes. I, I love I that agree. Hunter. Yeah. And when I went back this last time, I also, many of the professors there, which were my age and older, mm -hmm. were so grateful because I, first of all, I wasn't bending the knee to anything. Mm -hmm. I was just being authentically myself, but this was, I wasn't doing anything online. So I, it's art school. So I'm, you know, I'm trekking there right. and uh, it was and I already told you, you know, some of the young people that I became friends with and good friends with, you know, they gave me this weird pass. But the adults that had been around and seen stuff and were kind of moving out of that phase of their career were so grateful for the in-class counterpoints going on that I would bring up because of my age and I'm not afraid to talk. I would interact one of the things I noticed with a lot of the young kids in the classes that I had young kids in mm -hmm. is no one was talking. They were all afraid mm -hmm. to talk. So I would always, you know, I mean, we got it, the, the, the professors asking a question and then ultimately like all good things that happen, it inspired people to interact. And then we started to have really good classes because the shy person, and I always sit in the back. I don't care where I am. Child, I park in the back lot. I like the back. <laughs> and so, but all of a sudden the really shy ones started using their voice and coming forward. So I can say I got, I really loved, I loved it. I loved going uh, to school. In the end though, I didn't like, uh, there's a lot of other stuff that that did not inspire me. The curriculums had changed since I'd been in college last and the standards were way lower. And I went there to be challenged and I went there for, you know, I wanted to push myself. I was already established doing what I was doing. I didn't need any more of that, but I just wanted more creativity and I wanted to get in touch with what was going on. And so it's interesting. The thing is, I saw some of the younger teachers, the adjunct teachers, and um, just the, the newer generation coming in that were 30 and under, you know, 26 to 30, pushing the new, now modern narratives. So we would have, I had one particular teacher who taught, I don't want to say this out loud because if he listens, um, but he's well known. He, mm -hmm. he he does a lot of work in the design field. He's well known. And he would let us give us credit and let us out of class to go protest all the stuff that went down here in Portland. So it was all that crazy lefty shit. Right. And you get credit for it. And I thought, oh, dear, this is um, this is this isn't good. This isn't good. And so this was in the conversations I was having with the older teachers that were leaving, they were mentioning things like they were glad they were finally moving out of the system. And I was like, but 
you are actually needed in the system to balance this out. Because if everyone coming in that's 30, just, you know, getting their first teaching jobs and having gotten their master's and God knows that 30 people to balance, oops, you know, wherever they were along, Mm -hmm. I'm keep hearing an echo. You're still hearing it? No, now it's gone. Okay. But the the point of relevance here is there is a shift over. There's a generational change. And these some of these people that are around 30 are pushing these wild, really extreme agendas. And people are getting credit in school for participating in stuff that I don't believe should be part of a curriculum. You shouldn't get extra credit for going to protest something that has nothing to do with painting class. Exactly. I mean, come on. Yeah. Just like they shouldn't be teaching kids about sexuality in school, uh, meaning gender studies, race studies, bullshit. Um, kids will figure that out on their, on their own. They don't need to be nudged in any particular direction, but now it's just a part of, you know, five-year-old kids get taught about all these gender choices that you can have. And, and it's, I think it plants seeds that don't even need to, they're not even, it's not even an appropriate time for those seeds to be planted if they ever need to be planted. It's just, I just, you know, I go back to politics, you know, 100, 150 years ago when they had debates, they were seven hours long. So each person got three and a half hours to speak to real. It was a real long form conversation. So you could really get into delve into subjects and delve into what people's psyches and their belief systems were. Now we have this idea that we want to be liked. We don't want to rock the boat. We want to vote for the most popular kid. We don't want it to be challenging. So I think that's why a lot of these kids don't speak up because they're used to just being the observer and then going and tweeting about it or texting someone and saying, this person made me feel dot, dot, dot. I have this, (laughs) this uh, term that I've come up with, which is the makes me feel culture. So it's you, you're making me feel uncomfortable. You're making me feel no, (laughs) no one's making you feel shit. You have decided to take the stimulus that you have received and process it and perceive it in a specific way. And I think that form of disempowerment is what's fucked this, this particular uh, generation that we're talking about is this idea that they are not, they have zero power have no control whatsoever it's really by the you know the the whim of the wind it's whoever likes you that's where you put all of your attention and energy it's not based on your own integrity or your own sense of self or your own sense of accomplishment it's how is this going to be received and i pinpointed where this all began participation trophies Fact. When we introduced Fact. participation trophies and took the gratification that one receives from participating and, and completing something successfully, mm-hmm. that destroyed everyone's self-esteem, their, their ability to, to uh, take critical comments even. I mean, because remember, mm-hmm. a- after that, everyone backed off on, oh, don't, you know you don't want to trigger my kids so you got to be nice and we just danced around parents danced around everything thank god i was like before that but with my kids but ever you know after after my kids were born i mean that was kind of the whole mo with kids is you know this laissez-faire approach where you placate them constantly and terminal inclusiveness (laughs) yeah it's it's horrible yeah. But I think that's where it all started. That, in my mind, that's where it all started. That and it's grown into this today. And yeah. Well, and it's it just lazy sense. fucking parenting. It, it is. It's, I mean, it's just <laughs> lazy. It's just like, oh well, you, what you don't want to have a real dialogue with your kid and say, you know what? Sometimes you're not going to win in life. 
Sometimes, you you know, part of the greatest lessons I've ever learned in life was not by being the best at something. It was the effort that I put into that. It was honing the skills, whether it be writing or some physical achievement. It, it wasn't because I had nerfed the world around me to suit me, to make me feel good. It was that you know, I like, like a uh, Rinpoche says, you know, potatoes have to brush up against each other to get, you know, to wash the dirt off. Like mm -hmm. we have to have these engagements in order to, to test our metal, to see what we're all about. Mm -hmm. And if, if we aren't going on vision quests, if our children aren't being tested at all, then how the fuck are they going to know, you know, if we aren't around, how are they going to know how they're going to handle their business. They're not going to be able to. Right. So I think that's where my concerns lie is that, you know, people will figure out, okay, I don't want to be in a relationship with this person. I want to be in a relationship with this person. I want to be by myself. Be okay with that, but don't feel like you need the world's approval. I don't need to tell someone who they are. They should just be able to stand in their own space and be whatever that is without needing me to affirm or validate that. Mm -hmm. on, yes, absolutely. And on top of all that, <laughs> go back like three paragraphs. It killed the desire for people to strive to be better. Yeah. There, there was no drive in people when you say oh it's okay <laughs> oh. you know yeah you don't understand what i'm saying you yeah, absolutely but it also takes away the the satisfaction of achievement C correct like, if you get a trophy for instance to use continue using that example uh you you don't know that you got it because you did a great job or you excelled at something or you right. topped a record or something like that everybody got one of those fucking trophies yes. so you're just, it just homogenizes everybody. It just, it doesn't, it puts everybody on it. And I understand the motivation for wanting to put everybody on the same playing field, but everybody simply isn't on the same playing field. There should be multiple infinite playing fields. Like we don't have to include everybody in one group. Let them find their own groups. Right. They'll do it naturally and organically anyway. Right. I but love... if, unless you're officially labeled by the powers that be, you know, you're not in a, a real group. Then you're an outcast. Right. Yeah. That's my but, group. But what you're describing, though, is that mm -hmm. is the whole is. idea of equity, <laughs> right? That's what, okay. what equity. That's yeah. what this whole DEI thing's about. It's what SDG is yeah. about. It's what. Yes. Right. But equity, equal opportunity does not equal outcome. Uh, I agree. I agree. But so the quality can... of eco outcomes is the equity. And that's a distortion of reality. Right. But we can't assume that we can't assume that everyone is going to have an equal shot and everyone is going to end up at the same finish line. And I think that that's the the misconception about this is we all need to be billionaires and we all need to strive for financial success. But what about the inner workings? What about the who you are as a human being? Where does that fall in any of that? What I love is when they matter to communist. Well, it's so funny that you say that because I was just thinking, I've seen this post recently where it shows what children in China are learning in school That's compared right. to what children in America are learning. Mm -hmm. So in America, you want to be an influencer. You want to be, you know, have... 20 million followers on YouTube. We love you, YouTube. <laughs> you want to have like, you know, this great, great following, but it has nothing to do with really the substance that you have and, and who you are as a person where in China, they are not giving you praise for who you are as a person. It is, it is this communal reality as opposed to an individualistic culture. So this idea that who you are matters is completely gone. Like that's, that's eroded, that's disappeared. So the striving is how can I help my community be better? How can the community be the superpower? Not how can I get the most attention? Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I mean, I think it's all, it, it, it's, it's a substrate of materialism. Like we yeah. want the tangible, we want things that can be quantified and weighed and love and nuance and, uh, you know, 
not fitting into an easy umbrella out of the very few umbrellas that our society offers. That's not, that's not, you, you can't categorize that. You can't make a target market out of that. So it doesn't exist in the eyes of this materialist scientism based uh, society that is trying to keep a, a money making machine running. Um, we're the outliers. Uh, we're the dreamers. So there is no place for us in their scheme and that drives them nuts. So then they co-opt things like punk rock and you can get Ramones t-shirts at Target now. And <laughs> it's sad. <laughs> Everything yeah. is getting eaten up by the beast. We are in the fourth turning. If you're familiar oh. with that. No, tell me. What so that? there's this idea, this, the cycle of, uh, generations basically every generation it goes back to that old saying that you know uh har hard times create great men great men yeah. create great times great times create weak men weak men create hard times that fourth portion that weak men create hard times is the fourth turning mm -hmm. and we are in that generation right oh, now man, we're fucking deep into that yes Absolutely. yes yeah. It's a really but interesting I, book if uh, called The Fourth Turning, by the way. It's, okay, cool. Yeah. I'll check it out. I, I have a real sense of uh, the ability of the human to turn on a dime. And I think that so much of that, I believe in the hundredth monkey theory. And I, I believe that so much of this is really based on on the world we are creating. So if I wake up in the morning and I say the fucking world is on fire and we're at war and everything sucks, then the world is going to show me everything that supports that perspective. But if I walk in as a porous being and I put 100% of who I am into every exchange I have, I connect with every person that is willing that, that is a willing participant, then I think that all of this stuff is literally just one whisper to the left or to the right from a, really being a transformation. So I don't really agree with this idea that it's a foregone conclusion and we're all fucked. We could yeah. be. We definitely could be, but I don't think that, I think there are enough people on this planet right now who are vibrating at a higher frequency, who actually believe in better and see better and want better for their children, for themselves, for this planet, that I think it's possible. Oh, so so, that, so that's where I'm putting my energy. Right? <laughs> see, I think I, I like that a lot. And but I also come with a high level of woo here. Sure. And I'm, I'm wondering, is it possible? So I'm going to start with that. Is it possible that if we say take the Dante version of, mm -hmm. you know, we all know the Dante version, that as we change our vibrational rate, as we move through the rings of wherever we are um, conceptually hell at the moment, um, or at least you know, or at least at the beginning stages of it, is it possible depending upon uh, these, this nexus of, of personal transformation of, of personal uh, baptism by fire of being pushed into pressure to express what it is you are created of and um, again, this was one of the things I enjoyed about my generation or, or do enjoy mm -hmm. is that we really were a generation that was trying to push back against the norms. Right. And uh, it was I didn't have a lot of problems being an outsider. I attracted other outsiders mm -hmm. and you know it, it got on but i've never had a problem being alone i've never had a problem doing things alone and in fact I actually like being alone but i don't need a sex doll so <laughs> at the point of what i'm saying here is if all of this in the open air of the public that's getting crazier by the day more extreme and more cartoonish by the day is it possible that we are in some sort of say 
oven of sorts, alchemical ovens where we are moving energetically into another dimension. So, and then of course that opens up like, what does that look like? But are we, you know, is it possible we could be going down to the next level of hell or going up into the first level of, uh, you know, the, um, and, uh, what's the next, I did this on your show too, <laughs> it's, uh, because, oh, purgatory, purgatorio. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And, it, you know, so is this part of the process, but I'm taking a spiritual look at it, I suppose, but also it's kind of practical and the whole point is to find individuality is to actually express who you are what you are how you are and these experiences create uniqueness out of the collective the one rises from the many and that's you and that's the next person over there that's rising up out of this and the next person over there i think the mistake some people make is that it's a cult they think like in terms of the one christ or right the one savior but what if again we save ourselves so right. what if a bunch of us are actually collectively moving into another space and what we're dealing with right now that seems so cartoonish is actually the entry into something dark for me it looks darker it looks more hellish and of course it's separating there's a separation here again alchemical that could be why the whole digital overlay is so prevalent i hope that made sense i'm trying it to not totally have docking barking dogs it totally does. I think that there are multiverses going on at the same time that there, there are, it's, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. And I use that as a very loose reference, but it's like we, every day that we wake up, we have the opportunity to use our energy in the most impeccable, um, most uh, efficient way possible. I think there is the storyline where you know, I don't see time as, as being a linear, um, I see it more of a, like a Mobius strip. So I think it depends on what a curve of that strip that you're on. So some days you may wake up and you are in the zone and everything that you interact with is there with you. And it is just this synergy that's flowing. And then other days you may wake up and it's just like, pull the fucking sheets over my head. I don't want to get out of bed. I just can feel that it's not going to, it's, it's going to be a train wreck wherever I go or whatever interaction I have. But I think that's the thing that we are doing is we are honing this energy to get to its purest form. Uh, it can be hell in that process, or it can also be, um, you know, it's, it's smelting, <laughs> you know, you're just, you're trying to get down to the purest form of yourself that you possibly can. Yeah. You know, niche, what you made me think of before was the whole notion of a 5d earth and ascension and all that crap that was going on like five years ago. I don't know if you guys followed that at all. The new age people started channeling aliens who were telling them that a 5d earth was being created and that there's yeah. this. Yeah. 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 The event. The event. Yes, the event. Yeah. Which uh, is, is probably some kind of soul trap for all we know. <laughs> that's well, that's my guess. I, I mean, it's it, another it, passivity d dynamic, I think. Like you were saying earlier, Hunter, about men need to take or need to, we need to give men space to express themselves, so on and so forth. I think men, women, everybody, humans need to stop waiting for somebody to give them something they need to take it yes. and we need to take a yes. place in this fucking reality i know it seems that you said nish that it seems very dark uh like we're heading towards a dark place and it's a fine line between uh being cognizant of that possibility and not calling it in and i i'm still still teetering on that tightrope. Uh, I don't know where you guys, how you guys finagle that, but I'm leaning towards not calling it in. So how do you announce what's going on and the possibility of what might happen um, in order to just sound the trumpets to people who may not be aware of those things? 
And where do you go? This is the way it's going to be. It's going to suck. We're going to, this is going to happen. We're going to be this and that and the other. Yeah. What, what, what's the fine line? How do you guys navigate that? Oh, uh, for me, I, I don't know what's going to happen. So I choose no position. I'm mm -hmm. Stay neutral. I stay neutral. I don't know. You know, I have no idea what's going to happen. So I'm apolitical. I don't pick a side. I don't pick sides. I hate yeah, picking same sides. Here. Yeah. Um, sides and solution. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to the Masonic teachings with the black and white squares, the only way to get across is to stay in between. Mm. True. Deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you, so, how do you navigate the tightrope? Uh, I just don't let things affect me emotionally. I, mm -hmm. from this is my my mo uh, if if i tend to say oh that's a cool idea i'll really explore it and to the point where i'll either call it sh bullshit or say okay i'll add that to the pile of possibilities mm -hmm. so i have this giant pile of possibilities in my head but i've chosen no one of them to be correct because i don't know sure what so, about you I, I think it's, for me, it's a little more complex, but that no surprise there. Um, <laughs> it, it's, a, <laughs> it, it's a, um, just because I, I tend to be a little more elaborate or um, a little more, more flair. And so it, it is everything for me really is case by case. And I think that's true for Jerry as well, but I, I am never shying from keeping my finger on the pulse of what the collective's doing because I am part of it. Mm -hmm. And it is important for me to look at the shadow content. It is important for me to look where others don't want to look, yes. where they where they can't even see, first of all. And it is important to me to some extent to interact with that. Mm -hmm. And I do that, of course, psychically, and I do that well psychically and in the interacting with that i'm not because i'm looking at it because i'm engaging with it in that process i'm not wishing it to be here i'm just saying hey look i think you're all not seeing this this little bit over here you're not seeing this quicksand you think it's all just sand and then you're gonna get sucked up in it and so then this becomes like a an issue for me also in how do I perceive, how do I push forward my perceptions without front loading or in, I don't like to influence people, but I want to talk about the darkness I see. I am a person who loves beauty, love, higher thinking, higher right art, all this art culture. Those are my, my, that's my gig. My chart even reflects this yeah. uh, with that dark Saturn turn, but that's a generational thing. And so not engaging physically is a big part of how I walk the tightrope, but I do definitely engage artistically and through my voice and that is still a doing that's still a doing and uh i try also to remind i like to be the voice of reason for myself and if other people see then that then that's great and for me in these particular times i'm seeing more people not wanting to see all of this stuff that is is starting to really come around us in a very dark way yeah it's like conspiracy exhaustion mm -hmm. like there's just this exhaustion with th that's where it feels like it's a psychic war because there's so much that we are constantly being inundated with and this is something that i picked up you know along the way from many teachers is can you be centered in the eye of the storm can you maintain your center while all of this stuff is swirling around you? And that's the real test of who you are and your inner strength is, can you maintain and have a degree of discernment? And as Jerry was saying, being able to call bullshit, bullshit when you see it, I think that's such a valuable point and such a valid part of being able to 
you know, go inside and say, okay, what feel, what does this feel like to me? Not what does it feel like to the world, but how am I perceiving this? How am I receiving this? And then checking back in with that, because sometimes your first instinct is right. And sometimes it's because you have shields up. And so you, you were maybe judging something that, Uh, you know, upon further examination, it's like, oh, okay, I was in this mode or I just wasn't, I wasn't connecting with what was being said, but there is some, some shred of truth there that I can kind of tease apart. So I think that's a really valuable skill. I, I feel so connected to the way that you interact and engage with this world niche, because I feel like we're doing the same thing. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's such a pleasure with you too. It, you know, this is the thing. It's, it, I think most of us really want the beautiful good times. And I think that most people that I know would choose good times over suffering. But I think that most people understand that it's the suffering and the hardships that give that that give that the good times, the beautiful stuff, the actual color that it has. You, you learn the contrast and in learning the contrast, you can really appreciate the range of which we can explore. And this goes from, from everything from art to just politics to, to everything. There's so much. And when we get caught up in one one way or fixated in one wave of, of say, whatever's fashionable in politics or in fashion or in antiques or whatever, we lose sight of the fact that there's this whole realm outside of what is now being fashionable. It's right now it's fashionable to say you have all these different titles. I got PTSD. I got, you know, I got Ajita. I got all this. Everyone is just running around like with flare buttons, (laughs) Yeah. with what they have wrong with them. Exactly. I, you, how much do you hear this in, in conversations? You can be in a conversation with somebody and in the first five minutes, they tell you, I've got PTSD, I've got this and that and that, yeah. and you haven't even learned anything about them other than the the flair they're wearing on their shirt, what they're yeah. titling themselves right. to give themselves, to hedge themselves yeah. against anything that might actually push back upon themselves a question of who are you really and what are you really doing here and it's an excuse for behavior it's it's an excuse to be an asshole really you you pulled out the asshole card and said this is why i'm going to be an asshole because i have these diagnoses as opposed to (laughs) holding that and saying okay this is what i'm dealing with and being able to observe yourself when you get triggered <laughs> my favorite mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. my favorite term <laughs> and, and now t- trigger warnings are triggering to people did, yes. you hear, did you hear that one yes yeah it becomes more absurd but it, you know this in hunter this doesn't diminish if you do t- ptsd is a real thing exactly it, it's not diminishing that but it, it becomes like this like you're saying it is the excuse for future behavior so that yeah. it can be hedged upon that excuse. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, but you know, I've got this and I already told you that. So it, it's just like these traps in communication and in relationships that are very tricky. And I think this is part and parcel why we are seeing an uptick in people having relationships with real dolls and moving into the AI world at such an alarming pace. Yeah, because your doll can't trigger you. And if your doll does trigger you, if you do get it, because I I was having this discussion with my mentor and I was saying, well, can't the doll still offend you and hurt your feelings? Because you're dealing with a paraphilia that is so um, enmeshed and so fraught with layers that you're really the one who is offending yourself. (laughs) I've always said that, you know, being offended is a personal choice. 
It oh, is. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. I mean, we, <laughs> we yeah. can't control our environment, but right. we can control how we receive our exactly. environment. Exactly. What we do with the stimulus that we take in constantly. Exactly. Yeah. We only have four minutes to go before. Oh, my God. And I, I just wanted to say, hi, JJ. I love you. I, I just wanted to say hi and <clears> give <throat> you a yeah. shout out. It went so quick. You guys need to come back like <laughs> quarterly. We should have like quarterly recaps. That would be awesome. Hopefully we up for that. Absolutely. And, we uh, would absolutely love to. I did have one question from the audience, and it was something I wanted to ask at the beginning, but I didn't get a chance. Not anyone's sure. fault. It's my own fault. Uh, who was your best guest so far on your show? Oh, my God. That's a terrible or, or, question. Okay. Who's your, I'm, I worded it wrong. Who's your favorite <laughs> guest so far? <laughs> Who did you enjoy speaking with the most? Yeah, I am. See, my youngest son is always asking me ultimate questions like, yeah. "What's your favorite song?" Like, fuck. I know. I, I know. I'm the same way. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I, I wouldn't even. I would do yeah, yeah, yeah. that. So oh my god! You I'm really so, enjoyed talking. So to. I'm you, so deeply in love right now with all of our our female. The the, the yeah. alpha females. You mean besides hey. Nish, right? <laughs> besides what? Besides Nish, right? <laughs> yeah, besides that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not asking you to pick an ultimate one. I'm saying, who who is like a really good guest that I think you the, had a blast the one that sticks to. out the latest is like somebody that's in the, the little clan too, Emily Moyer. I was oh, Emily's say, great. It's the, Mind it's, blower. It's the trifecta. It's Emily Moyer. It's Danny Katz, and yeah. it's Nish. Yeah. yeah, I am. I am a fangirling <laughs> with these three women right now. I just, I, I want us all to live in the same area with JJ, so we can all just hang out and. Oh, I'll, I'll make be the tea. I'll be the designated driver. Yeah, right? y'all need to move down to Florida with me, where it's warm. <laughs> what did you say, Jerry? You all need to move down to Florida with me where it's warm. Yes. Yeah, Florida is a hard <laughs> pass for me. <laughs> hard pass. Lord have mercy, too many big bugs, all of it. Yeah. This has been such a great pleasure. You two oh. are so fun and relaxed and casual and mm. deep and powerful and funny. I just, oh. I can't love on you both enough. Too it's many, just oh, wonderful. Too Thank many, you so too much. Too many adjectives there for me. I know, I but I could keep rolling them too. I know and you that's can. not love bombing. That's I know. real. No, I know. I agree. It's, I agree. They're amazing. I lo we love you guys. It's it was been lovely an on this end, honor yeah. and a pleasure to meet you, Jerry. Yeah, Thank likewise. you so much for having us. We've never done a live before, so no. this is yeah. this has done this weird thing to my brain <laughs> because Chris pulled up the chat, and so I was trying to watch the yeah. chat and I was watching you guys. See what and, I'm saying? And I, I was can't look. Like, all over the place. Yeah. But I just, I love you. Thank you. Yes. I love Chris. He's my soulmate, my partner. Oh, we we, we are having so much fun in this life together. And I just thank you guys so much for giving us this yes. opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Let's do it again. Definitely. Please. Absolutely. And thank you everyone for uh, watching and listening and we'll see you uh, next week. We've got Wait. Ben what? Wait, Jerry. So how do people find you? Oh, right. How do people find the melt and all this? Give us those deets. There's that. You can basically get to everything melt oriented at uh, the meltpodcast.net. Everything can be found there. We're on Rumble. We're on, of course, YouTube. We're on Telegram, Instagram, all the shit, Facebook, all the data harvesting uh, That's right. social Inst networks. Instacart will come and deliver you <laughs> groceries. <laughs> we'll deliver you cash. subversive content we'll to your door. Exactly. We'll do, we'll do it all. Um, and I'll even come and wash your, your real doll if you really need it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. <laughs> Talk about <laughs> that. that. <laughs> oh, and you guys can email me. If anyone wants to email me, you can reach me at hunter-muse at protonmail.com. We love you, and thank you so much. And the other basic email is uh, the, the melt podcast at protonmail.com. Yeah. Cool. And I, I, put, I put your links in the description. People can find it. Cool. Thank right, you so cool. much. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Much we'll be more. back next week with a pre-recorded episode with Ben Davidson from Suspicious Observers. So that's going to play next week. So anyway, that's all I got. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Nice.